This is Decision 2022 on KOB4. Tonight, New Mexico's first debate in this year's race for governor, featuring Democratic Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham and Republican challenger Mark Ronchetti. Now, our moderators, Tessa Mentis and Matt Grubbs. And good evening, New Mexico. We have more than a month until Election Day, but it's been a very long campaign so far that will ultimately lay the groundwork for where we take our state. I'm Tessa Mentis. And I'm Matt Grubbs. Debates are a storied part of New Mexico's political tradition, one of the few chances voters have to hear their candidates contrast their ideas for improving life in our state. And tonight we'll hear from the leading candidates in this race, the Republican and Democratic candidates for governor, incumbent Democrat Michelle Lujan Grisham and Republican challenger Mark Ronchetti. They are both joining us here at our KOB4 studios tonight. And here are the rules our candidates have agreed upon. They will each have 90 seconds to introduce themselves. Then they'll have 60 seconds each to answer our questions. And we want to encourage reasonable conversation tonight, so they'll also have up to 60 seconds each for a rebuttal on each question. After that, it's up to us, the moderators, to decide if we'll move on or maybe dig in a little bit deeper. Finally, each candidate will have 60 seconds to deliver closing remarks. So, candidates, thanks to you both for being here. We flipped a coin to determine the order of opening and closing statements. Mark Ronchetti, you will begin. Go well, ahead. thanks very much, Matt. I appreciate the time tonight. I appreciate the governor's time. New Mexico is at a crossroads, there's no doubt. We have a big choice in this election, and we've all seen the numbers. We're second in violent crime, and unfortunately, this governor has been letting out violent criminals for the past two years under COVID orders. In fact, she just stopped doing it over the past week when we called her out on it. And as you look at our prison population, it's actually 20% lower than when she took office. We have soft on crime judges, and we still have catch and release. If you think the system is broken, she is the head of the system. We're 51st in education. Three quarters of our kids can't do math to grade level, and almost three quarters can't read to grade level. And you look at where we are being behind with COVID, with no plan to catch up. If you think the education system is broken, this governor is the head of that system. And so many families across the state struggle to get to the end of the month with enough money. But one group that's not struggling is the government in Santa Fe. The government in the state of New Mexico has never been richer. But I would ask you, has that helped you in your family? So often, the answer is no. And the governor's gonna tell you tonight that I haven't been in government long enough or I don't have the government experience to solve these problems. But the fact is, her 30 years of government experience has us right where we are. We can get better. We can make our streets safer. We can educate our kids better. And we can absolutely put more money in your pocket. But we have to change direction. And I look forward to laying out that plan tonight. Mr. Ronchetti, thank you. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, your opening remarks. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for having us tonight. Now, look, we've come actually a long way in four years, but as New Mexicans, we've been through a lot. But I remain steadfast in my optimism about what comes next, because despite the challenges of a pandemic and wildfires and floods, we have transformed the trajectory of our beloved state. Unemployment is at a 14-year record low, with 28,000 jobs added just last year. We've invested billions of dollars into the public school classrooms, into pay raises for teachers, into expanded pre-K and daycare, and free tuition-free higher education for thousands of New Mexicans. We have strengthened and diversified our economy, and we've made it easier for more people to access the health care that they need. The seeds are planted. Positive change is truly our destiny. But Progress is not promised, and the threat of going backwards is real. We need to keep rebuilding our mental health system. We need to put more public safety into our neighborhoods, and we need the strength of the state to address the problems that are plaguing our cities. In fact, just like right here in Albuquerque. But I want to talk about what's really at stake in this election. My opponent wants to ban abortion. New Mexico women deserve a constitutional right to privacy and to make their own highly personal health care decisions. As governor, I will protect their access to reproductive health care and their rights to make those decisions. Thank you. 
Governor Lou Grisham, thank you very much. We are going to go ahead and get started into our questions, and we're going to start with crime. To many of our viewers, it feels like crime in our state, especially here in the metro, has moved beyond the crisis level. We are on pace to break another homicide record in Albuquerque. We know drugs, guns, mental health, and poverty all intersect this issue. So what will be your top specific crime-related legislative priority to help remedy crime in New Mexico? And how do you plan to get Republicans and Democrats at the Roundhouse on board? Governor, you'll begin. Well, first let's talk about what we've already done. Look, crime is on the rise nationally. It's no secret that it's also a problem right here in New Mexico and in Albuquerque, as you just stated. But over the last four years, we've invested a record 400 plus billion into public safety. And what does that mean? It means making sure that we're giving our police officers the raises and dignity they deserve, the professional development and training, the tools to keep them safe, the equipment and vehicles, a new crime lab. And let's take a step back. The former governor actually created policies, including one that mirrors the Mark Ronchetti's plan to cut government. We lost more than 400 officers just here in Albuquerque alone. We've added back just in the last, or announcement in the last couple of weeks, to put back more than 317. We've increased the penalties for repeat offenders and violent offenders, and we're making sure that we have additional FBI and U.S. Marshal presence. Next session, we get bail reform over the finish line. And Mr. Ronchetti, your answer. Yeah, a long list there that is not doing any good and in fact is making it worse. What the governor doesn't tell you is over the past two years, she's released nearly 700 people back out on the streets and many of them have gone right back and committed violent crimes. That is a horrible idea and one that we have to get away from and we absolutely will. And when you look at this governor's policies, what has she done from the get-go? We still have catch and release. And the governor used to brag that she could get anything through the legislature. She didn't get that through. We will get catch and release through the legislature because nothing is going to go through until we protect the people of this state. And unfortunately, when we have soft on crime judges, many of which this governor has appointed, they are turning people right back out on the street. It's the reason that the Albuquerque Police Officers Association has endorsed my campaign. It's the reason that the Fraternal Order of Police have endorsed my campaign. This governor signed a bill to make it easier to sue police officers, and now we can't get them on the streets. I know she gave a pay raise to the state police, but guess what? Across the rest of the state, we can't recruit people to do this job, including at the state police level. There has to be a change here. She hasn't taken crime seriously. Time, We're the Ryan second Cody. most violent state in the country for a reason. Governor, you have up to a minute for a rebuttal if you'd yeah. like. Both words from someone who's never even been to a legislative session, who's never had to deal with any of these issues directly, for someone who's failing to uh, uh, admit that we have 400 fewer officers from his mentor, former Governor Susana Martinez. When he talks about lower correction stats, you know what that is? Fewer arrests. You know why we have fewer arrests? Because we have fewer police officers. In fact, the 50 million, actually it's now 72 million that we're spending to have more police officers and give raises is available for raises is statewide. That is just false. And in fact, in the last governor's administration, four more, 4,000 more individuals were released. He wants you to focus on the things that he can't do or build. If we continue to make the investments, hold people accountable, and make sure that we're getting the public safety resources that we need, and quite frankly, working together, I have no doubt that violent offenders, including the enhanced penalties, get off our streets, and those criminals get off our streets. Let's have a conversation about gun violence and guns on our streets, Mark. Governor, I'm happy to have any discussion you would like, and it's funny that you say that, that I don't understand this because I haven't been to a legislative session. Are you kidding me? Everybody in Albuquerque lives it, Governor. We live it. We live the crime every day. You don't have to go to the Roundhouse because you guys don't have any crime in the Roundhouse. It's the exact reason that you're so out of touch with the problems that we have. You blame fewer arrests on fewer cops when you make it easier to sue cops so we can't recruit them? You've got to be kidding. 
we can do better than this. We can absolutely do better than this. And the fact of the matter is, you say hold people accountable, you've done anything but. You have a parole board that has a mantra, when in doubt, let them out. That's what they keep doing. We've had enough, and this isn't a partisan issue. I know plenty of Democrats who look at this and say, we can do better than this. I know plenty of independents, all of us realize we have to change. But he can't be a 30-year politician that talks about going to the roundhouse as a solution. All right, thank you both. So let's talk a little bit about the pretrial detention of people accused of crimes. You have both expressed support for increased pretrial detention. Different studies have suggested it might not make much of a difference. Why do you think increased pretrial detentions would make a difference? And what is your specific plan to keep more people in jail as they await trial? Mark Ronchetti, you get to start here. Well, Matt, what we have to have is we have to have a presumption of detention. And what we have right now is we just continually turn people right back out on the street. And we have a bunch of different avenues where this is happening and unfortunately the governor has a role in every one of them and as we look not only at people being released by the governor's own pen but by these soft on crime judges who continually use something called the Arnold tool especially here in the metro area to turn people out what is that well effectively that's a tool that's used and it's an equation they use and they put some information into it they put an offender into it and they tell you whether they should be released or not well in most cases guess what they say they should be released and guess who is one of the governor's bigger benefactors it is the person who came up with the Arnold tool, John Arnold. We have to take this seriously. So we have to end the catch and release across the state of New Mexico. We have to also stiffen the penalties under our three strikes law and expand those penalties as well so that those that commit violent crime end up paying for it in due time behind bars here. But this governor has proven with the skyrocketing violent crime that she just doesn't take it seriously. Thank you, Mr. Ronchetti. Governor Lujan Grisham, your thoughts on pretrial detention? Well, first, uh, this notion that it's just this governor. We are going to hear a lot of name throwing, at name uh, throwing, and finger pointing, and it's really outrageous. The root causes of crime have been an issue in this state for decades, and let's not forget that this is a state that eradicated all access to drug addiction and mental health services. Look, I actually think that the pretrial uh, d or detention reform could make a difference here and I'll tell you why. It's working for the federal system, it creates consistency, you don't have to use any discretionary aspects and I'm going to keep fighting until we get that over the finish line and in fact the, that I can point to any number of public safety investments is proof positive that I'm the most suited and the most experienced candidate to get that done and quite frankly I'm a little offended about this whole notion about Santa Fe uh, and uh, legislative work it's complicated and hard, and I've demonstrated the ability to do that. I was, I have grandchildren in Albuquerque, and my family is here. Let's make no mistake, I'm serious about it everywhere. Governor, thank you. Mr. Ronchetti, you have up to a minute to respond. Governor, we're offended. We're offended because we live in this community, we all realize we have to fight crime, and yet we can't get the simplest bills through to protect the people of this state. It's absolutely unbelievable. And the fact that you get offended over lawmakers getting their feelings hurt, while families, families like the Hills who lost Jacqueline Vigil in her drive way to someone who comes up and just shoots her randomly. The families all across this city that watch us go through year after year of record homicides. The families across this city who have had enough of the property crime. It's so bad that many people don't even bother reporting it anymore because they know how overwhelmed our police officers are. And if we're thinking about trying to help that and recruit more police officers, you've targeted them and made it easier to be a criminal than to be a cop. It's enough. And when you look at all of this, you look Look at the problems. This is what a life in politics does. You sit around a table with pointy headed people that tell you emptying the prisons are going to make things safer. We are absolute proof that that is not true. And Governor Rebuttal. Okay. Um, unbelievable. Look. These are serious issues that require serious solutions, and it's not just one bail reform, which I'm sure my opponent had never heard of until he decided to run for governor. These investments, not having enough police officers to arrest people, to attack crime, and not having enough DAs to actually prosecute crime are a huge issue in our communities. Here's what his government plan is. A 35% across the board cut. Do you know what 85% of the budget is? 
public safety, health care, education. How many fewer police officers? How many reductions in pay? How many fallen officers aren't going to have the best benefits in America? Because you've decided that you believe that what you call government folks who work tirelessly every day, including, by the way, public uh, police officers are public servants. You tell a police officer who's getting the raises and the respect and the training and the safety that they deserve, that they're not respected today in the state of New Mexico. Governor, thank you. We want to move now on to abortion. Wait, <coughs> excuse me, the governor just gave me a policy that I don't actually to these, have. To these rules. We, okay. yeah. And we will have time later for rebuttals. We do want to get in as many questions as possible because we want to talk about abortion, another hot topic for a lot of New Mexicans. Since the U.S. Supreme Court's June decision, abortion has become an important issue in this race. So please articulate your position on abortion restrictions, if any, and explain what legislation you would propose when it comes to reproductive rights or abortion. And Governor, you'll go first. Well, let's be clear. If Mark Ronchetti was governor today, abortion would be illegal in the state of New Mexico. But because I'm governor, abortion is legal in the state of New Mexico. Just a year ago, I repealed a ban on abortion right here in our state. During his primary, when he was debating, regulating abortion at all stages, he was literally dancing on the grave of Roe v. Wade. You look on his website today, you can't really see what he was saying in the primary. He's flip-flopped more on this issue than the weather changes right here in New Mexico. Let me be clear, as long as I'm governor, a woman's constitutional right to privacy, to make her own highly, deeply personal decisions about her health care and her families will stay legal. He's playing right out of the Republican playbook nationally. Say anything to get elected, but work towards a national ban on abortion. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Ronchetti, your answer. Now, my, my opinion on this and, and my beliefs on this have never changed. I am pro-life, and I think we need to end late-term abortion in the state of New Mexico. If you look at where the governor's position is on this, there are countries that have the governor's extreme position of abortion up to birth. They're China and they're North Korea. And to me, that is extreme. And so here's what I've said, and here's what I'll continue to say. This is a very personal issue for so many people in the state of New Mexico, and no politician should make it for you. The governor wants to make it for you. In fact, she appropriated $10 million for a late-term abortion clinic in Las Cruces to service Texas. I just think that's an overstep, and I think we need to bring it to you, the people. So here's what I think we should do. I think we should have a constitutional amendment put on the ballot that's laid out by the legislature, and they should have a chance to write it up, and then everybody in the state of New Mexico should be able to vote on it and come up with something that fits our shared values. I don't think any politician should walk right in and start telling you exactly how this should work. And so that's why I think it's most important that the most people have a voice. Mr. Ronchetti, thank you. Governor, additional thoughts here? Look, a constitutional amendment that he's proposing is a ban on abortion. He wants other people to vote. Mark Ronchetti wants to vote about a deeply personal decision that I may or may not have to make. Abortions later in pregnancy are extreme medical emergencies. I, in my first pregnancy, had an extreme medical emergency and I was lucky. The medical advancements today don't make you have to wait that long. And thank God I didn't have to make a decision about whether or not I could have a baby or have my own life saved. A constitutional amendment is so that he can decide whether or not you have any access to your own or right to make your own health care decisions. And where have we seen this play out before? Republicans say one thing when they want to be elected and do another when they're actually elected or appointed. Who remembers Brett Kavanaugh in his confirmation hearings to be a U.S. Supreme Court justice said, Roe v. Wade is established law. I would never do anything to take away a constitutional right. As a Trump Justice, he did just that. Governor, thank you. Mark, your response? 
No, it's it, it's very clear in this particular situation, and, and I think when you look at where we are, let's talk about when we occasionally see something go to the voters and they get an opportunity to vote on it. The governor was okay when she brought pay raises to the legislature to the voters. She thought that was important, and and we should include that. But this issue, abortion, a sensitive issue, there's no question about that, a very personal issue. No, that one we can't actually let you vote on. And this fits the playbook that she's been operating out of for a long time. When she shut down schools, did you have a voice in that? No. When she shut down small businesses and we had lines in front of Walmart, did you have a voice on that? When she went and released violent <coughs> criminals back out onto the street, did you have a voice in that? No. So then we get into abortion and here we go again. No voice for you. She'll decide for you. I just have a different approach. Mark, thank you. We want to take a little bit of extra time with this. 30 seconds each for you both. Governor, your response on this? Again, the fact that anyone should get to vote about my personal health care decision is quite frankly outrageous. And to compare that to legislative pay raises or any other issue that on a referendum can provide guidance or actual decision making, what else are you going to decide for me? Women don't have the same rights if any voter in New Mexico, including men like Mark Ronchetti, can make that decision for me. We're going back to further back than the 1950s. It's outrageous. Governor, thank you. Mr. Ronchetti? I'm not deciding anything for you. I think you should vote on it. All right. Thank you. I Our don't need someone to vote on whether or not I can make a Governor. decision about my own health care. Governor, thank you. I'm we sorry. We Fair enough. Move on. Thank you, Matt. Our next topic is the cost of living. Just like everywhere else, it costs a whole lot more to live in New Mexico than it did in recent years. Regular people who yep. don't qualify maybe for public assistance are having to stretch their dollars further for housing, to buy food, and everything else. What can you do as governor to make it easier to afford life in New Mexico? And Mark Ronchetti, you have the first crack. On this one. Well, we have an economic plan on this, Matt, that we have on our website. We'd love for you to check it out. It's an eight point plan. But if you make more than $24,000 a year in the state of New Mexico, whether it's your small business or you personally, you pay the second highest tax rate in the state. That has to change. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cut taxes for working families. Anybody that makes under $100,000 a year, small business or in your household, will see their overall income taxes cut by 50%. That money needs to go into your pocket so you can can provide for your families. What we're also proposing is an oil and gas revenue program for every single New Mexican every single year. What that means is for every billion dollars that the state takes in, each New Mexican gets $100. And it looks like we could be seeing revenue numbers around $8 billion over the next couple of years. That would mean a family of four would get $3,200. And that can help you get where you need to go. But the governor has a different approach. There's no doubt. She's grown government 40% in her four years. She has never ever taken seriously cutting taxes and helping working families out. So as we look at where we are right now, she cut taxes by, what, one-eighth of one percent on the gross receipts tax, threw out a one-time benefit. Mr. We Ron need Kenny. benefits every single year. Time is up. All right, Governor, same question to you. All right, so again, uh, my record isn't being accurately described by my opponent. We've proposed and delivered record tax relief. But first, let's take a moment. Look, inflation does make it tough for families. Food, gas, utilities, housing, which is why we've provided more than a billion dollars in debt direct relief to New Mexico families. $1,500 for families just this summer. So he says he proposes it. I already did it. The gross receipts tax he's talking about helps small business first tax relief on gross receipts in more than 40 years. We've also lowered taxes uh, for Social Security beneficiaries, for veterans, and the working families tax credit that he wants to engage in did it twice. We've done that more than any other governor in the last several generations of governors, and more is coming. The child tax credit. All of those, New Mexico's the only place in America where that's been extended. Don't tell me about taking my own plan for supporting New Mexicans and that you'll deliver that in a Democratic legislature. Governor, thank you. Mr. Ronchetti, uh, more thoughts here. And I think I would ask everyone watching tonight, and the governor talks about these big, huge tax breaks you've gotten. Have you 
felt it? Have you felt it in your bottom line? Do you look at things now and you say, yes, I can afford what I need to afford. I can afford gasoline at $4 a gallon because of terrible environmental policy and policy by Joe Biden. Can I afford the additional cost that we have at the grocery store because we have skyrocketing inflation thanks to all the governor's tax cuts? It's just ridiculous. I mean, at this point, working families are being crushed and small businesses are being crushed. During COVID, we lost 40% of our small businesses because of the way this governor operated and because she did not listen to the voices of the people of this state. So to bring them back, we are going to have the largest small business tax cut in the history of the state. We're going to cut gross receipts every year in office here. That's one of the big things that stops investment in the state of New Mexico. And this governor does it once and goes an eighth of a point or maybe a quarter point if you add it all together and says, look at all the great things I've done. Unfortunately, those aren't enough and they're not getting things done for working families. And so we will. Governor, your thoughts on that? 60 well, seconds. Uh, thank you. Inflation isn't something that a governor control, but a governor can make the investments. My opponent is describing investments we've already made, more than a billion and a half to business, a billion directly to taxpayers. I guess he doesn't remember April 20th, 2020, when oil and gas went to negative $37 a barrel. What kind of tax relief and support or direct investments would you make then if you'd hitch your wagon to a volatile want? One only economic plan. You can't do it. We're delivering. The Mexicans are paying too much. We are doing rental assistance, affordable housing. We've reduced and taken away co pays on mental health services. We're reducing the cost of health care. We're giving you money directly back into your bank account. And by the way, gas is about $3.63. All right, thank you. We have now arrived at our agreed upon break. We will continue the second half of this debate in just a few minutes. We'll see you then. Every balloon fiesta is amazing, but this is the 50th celebration, so we're going all out. We will have coverage for you on the field, on air, online at KOB.com for all of the fan favorites, and of course, the balloonatic himself's forecast. And with all of the new stuff we're going to be looking for, we've also got some old familiar faces coming your way. Happy 50th anniversary. Happy anniversary. The balloon fiesta. The most magical experiences. Launch it, Albuquerque. We look forward to celebrating with all of you here on KOB4.
today's dollars, New Mexico's just now spending in the key categories, public safety, education, and health care, 85% of the budget, what we were spending 16 years ago. In these record surpluses, I'm dedicated to doing the following things. One, continue to put money into savings. I would do at least a quarter of that. That could be a billion. Uh, in addition, additional rebates for New Mexicans. I want to make sure that we're investing in, in uh, health care and in mental health particularly, and I want more money for affordable housing, public safety, and education, particularly on the front end. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Ronchetti, your response? Yeah, I think what we have to start to look at here is a few different things. There are obviously obligations that the state has that we need to continue to meet, and we can absolutely do that. But also, this state government has never been bigger, and it's never been richer. And what I would ask you again is, in your own family, how is that playing? Is it benefiting you? So I think we need to make sure that we have the right balance. And the governor and I disagree on this just a little bit. And I think when she came into office, she inherited a $2 billion dollar surplus. So as, as much as she's seen extra money over the past few years, thanks to massive oil and gas revenue, she came in in a very good position when Governor Martinez left. So what we have to do now is twofold. We have to invest in small businesses across New Mexico. They've been getting crushed. You look at the tax structure in this state. You look at how difficult it is for them to operate. We need to help them. That's why we're proposing the largest tax cut for small businesses in the history of the state of New Mexico. And we need to put money back in your pocket. These are unprecedented times with inflation, and you need help to get to the end of the month. We have the money to do both, and we should. Governor Lujan Grisham, you have another minute on this. We stayed in a recession far longer than any other state in America because there were no investments in diversifying and strengthening the economy. He keeps telling you that this is the biggest budget ever. That's just frankly not true, and I don't know where that $2 billion was. I can tell you we had up to 40% vacancy rates in critical services across government, including a lawsuit about not having sufficient funding to support minority children, frankly all children, in our public education system. These record revenues are because our economic policies work. And how do they work? We're investing directly into small businesses. We have 300 plus more restaurants today than when I took office and after the pandemic. We have more small businesses moving to New Mexico than ever before, and we added more jobs during the pandemic than the last administration did in four years. We are doing economic investments that are targeted to small businesses. We're providing employee and employee training and support to small businesses. And you know what they want? A ready workforce. And how are they going to get that? Because they now have free tuition college for workers. Governor, thank you. Mark, you have a minute here. Governor, this is where I would argue again that you're out of touch with the people of your own state. When you look at where we are, you've even said cities are booming and rural communities are thriving. But if you actually go to those communities and you talk to small business owners, they've been devastated by where we are and they don't see the investments that you talk about. You have a blizzard of programs, but when it comes down to actually helping people on the ground, the results are scant if they're there at all. So what we have to be able to do is begin to stand up with real programs that help small businesses cut our gross receipts tax every year. If you talk to small business owners, what they'll tell you is that's one of the biggest impediments they deal with. We also have to make sure that we are cutting rates on those small business owners as well. And again, the oil and gas revenue that we have, not all of it goes to one place clearly, but it can be there to help families that desperately need it as well. And we also have to invest in vocational training across the state here. We haven't done enough of that too often. Our vocational training schools will run off of grants. That's year to year. It is not a long-term investment. So there are a lot of things we can do, but unfortunately, Governor, a lot of your programs are not making a difference for people on the ground. Thank you, Mr. Ronchetti. We are actually going to pick it up from there. Our next topic is education. New Mexico's education system ranks at or near the bottom nationally. Recently, our public education department revealed our students are even more behind with only one in three students proficient in reading and science and one in four proficient in early literacy and math. Education leaders have said to us many of the moves we made might not pay off for possibly another decade as we work out in the pandemic. Where can we make the most gains the fastest and what is your plan to do so? And Mr. Ronchetti, you begin here. Yeah, Matt, let's start with reading. I think that's where we've got to go first. Every piece of research that you do, 
and that we know about what education says. If kids can read to proficiency by third grade, they're going to be much more likely to graduate high school. So what we're proposing is this $1,500 stipend for first through fourth graders. For every one of them that is reading below grade level, we will invest in them for extra tutoring and get them up to where they need to be. Right now, their numbers are differing in some spots, but many areas now it looks like it's 27% that can read to proficiency. That number is dangerously low for our kids. So we're going to invest in that. And we're also going to invest in catching our kids up. We should have had summer learning programs this past summer all across the state of New Mexico. Unfortunately, the governor didn't do that, and it was a huge missed opportunity. We need to continue to invest in kids so they can finally catch up here. And we have to make sure that we are allowing teachers to get help in the classroom. But more money for the teachers is a great start, but too many teachers go into a classroom with 32 kids, and they don't have an ability to make the difference that they could. We need to invest the money in smaller class sizes. Mr. Roncetti, thank you. Governor, you may respond. Well, I appreciate the support for education policies by my opponent. In fact, we do need smaller class sizes. You can't defund education on the front end and then expect to have any of the outcomes that we deserve, our kiddos deserve, on the back end. So now that we have smaller class sizes, we've added more than 350 educators just this year. We have the highest paid public school educators in the Southwest. Uh, and more are coming, smaller class sizes and more time in the classroom, which is something else that we're funding. This broad investment, I really do think, pays off. I disagree that it takes a decade, but I do agree it is not an overnight effort. We have a mandatory literacy program in every single elementary school in the state. That is new. That's what we did over the summer. We did it actually over the last semester. Really we're Working to make sure kids have the tools that they need and the game changer pre-k universal every three and four year old has access to quality pre-k in the state of New Mexico. Mr. Ronk, how do you have another minute? When we look at where we are with education it's clear what's happened here because our kids sat out of school the sixth most days of any state in the country it was absolutely devastating because we're 51st in education that was a terrible miss by the governor and we're still paying for it today and we're likely to continue you to pay for it. And, you know, when you look at where things are in a broader sense here, we are having trouble catching our kids up, so we obviously have to continue to invest in that. But when you look at why we did all this through COVID and where we sit right now, we're sixth in death in the country. It didn't work. And now we have kids that are struggling because of it here. So we need to, of course, invest more in our mental health for our children. We have 76 child psychiatrists across the state of New Mexico. We can't get them to show up and help our kids kids because we've made it so difficult for doctors to practice here. There's a lot of things that work here, but investing in our education is critical and doing the same old things we've done over the past four years has led to a slide in results, not improvement. Governor, you have another minute. Well, my opponent wants to pretend that there was not a deadly global pandemic, and in fact, Arizona and Texas, our neighbors, saw far higher per capita deaths. We also have the sickest population per capita in terms of chronic diseases that this virus caused higher mortality rates in the country. We led the country in testing per capita. We led the country in getting personal protective equipment. We led the country in vaccines. We led the country in vaccines to uh, minority communities and today our sovereign nations are the highest vaccinated populations as a collective in the world. Let's not pretend that. Most of our kids, more than anyone in the country per capita, are living with grandparents who are most at risk. I protected teachers. I protected kiddos. 2,000 kids in, in New Mexico today don't have parents because of COVID. So let's not pretend that this was easy or that we just did this because it was politically expedient. If we'd had a president, Trump, who took COVID seriously and education serious, we would be in a different position. So what have we done? We've stayed the course. We're investing now. It will, in fact, make the differences that we need. Governor, thank you. In the same vein, we want to talk about early childhood education specifically. When they vote for governor, should New Mexicans say yes or no to Constitutional Amendment 1, which would take more money from our state's permanent fund for early childhood education? If yes, how should that money be spent? If no, what is a better plan for early childhood education?
Governor, you may begin. Well, I say yes. Uh, I uh, campaigned on getting that uh, proposal through the legislature and before the voters, making sure that we take a small pinch out of the land grant permanent fund. Our endowment fund for education is critical. Every business organization, including the Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce, says that we need investments that will stay the course of time in early childhood. If we want to deal with reading in the third grade, second grade, first grade, kindergarten. We need our kids better prepared. That means quality pre-K education, every three-year-old and four-year-old, in those classrooms. That means paying those educators more. We need to do more of that, although New Mexico's led the nation in getting pay raises and standing up those uh, classrooms and schools all across the state. We need to make sure that that professional development and training, and we got to support families to access those programs in a meaningful way. Absolutely. 200 million for our elementary schools and our early childhood education programs. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Ronchetti, what do you think? Well, I think when you look at the land grant permanent fund, it, it is really created to make sure that we have a backstop for when oil and gas is not the major factor that is in our economy right now. And so, with that as the framing, I think right now, when you look at where funding is, especially where funding is for early childhood, we have enough funds for it right now. So, to me, it would make more sense to wait and see what happens with this. I personally would not support it. But if you do want to support it, what I would say about it is, who do you trust with spending that money in a way that it will be used wisely so it actually makes a difference in your life? Again, a blizzard of programs that someone who's been in government for 30 years can tick off very quickly, but an actual difference in your life is a totally different story. So when you look at where we spend this money and what we have to do, what I would support in this thing is saying, look, we'll be much more judicious in the way we handle every single dollar, and we will still invest every single dollar we we need to to get where we need to go. Uh, Governor, your thoughts on this? Another well, minute. Good. New Mexico's actually leading the country in investments and strategies for early childhood education and investments in our most vulnerable families. We're the only state in America right now where child poverty is going in the right direction. All the other states, and I think it's tied to the pandemic, are going the opposite direction. Trust the governor who actually did it. Trust the governor who has trained and recruited early childhood educators. Trust the governor who said she would deliver pay raises for educators in the classroom. Trust the governor who said that these investments would lead to more educators. Trust the governor who said tutoring and extended learning and summertime learning were all part of a designed comprehensive package to really focus on our kids. Do not trust a candidate who is saying to you that he's going to cut state government by 35%. 85% of the budget is public safety, police officers, health care, doctors, and education, kids and teachers. Trust the governor who's already done that work. All right, Mr. Ranchetti, you have another minute. Trust the governor who's never spent more money and never gotten fewer results and never put us in a spot where our kids are farther behind than they are right now. And I don't know where the governor gets this 35% slashing government by 35%. That is never a proposal that we've made, but we have made an economic proposal that's very clear that's on our website that we've laid out in the direction we want to go. We can absolutely invest in our kids, but if we're going to invest in our kids and we need to continue to do that, we have to make sure we're investing in their health care as well. And many of you know this. When you go to get a doctor's appointment for your child, what ends up happening? How long do you wait? You wait longer and longer periods of time. Why? Because doctors are fleeing the state right now because of bills that this governor has signed. House Bill 75, she raised insurance rates for doctors 900%. And that's why you can't get a doctor for your kids. That's why we have so many issues with health care across the state of New Mexico. So again, all of these are intertwined. And what we can do is invest and bring people to this state who are going to be critical in making sure that we get not only our education system on track, but our medical system too. Thank you, Mr. Ronchetti. The next topic on our list is the Children, Youth, and Families Department. Legislative analysts and outside evaluators say caseworkers at CYFD are overworked and underperforming. It's making children less safe. Republican or Democrat, governors have not been able to move the needle much when it comes to CYFD's performance. What are the major problems with CYFD first, and what will you do to address them? Mark Ronchetti, you may answer. Matt, right now, too often, vulnerable children are being put back into danger 
dangerous situations. It's happening with frightening regularity, and this governor never answers for it. In fact, the Albuquerque Journal called New Mexico the land of child endangerment. And when the governor ran for office four years ago, she said she was uniquely qualified to handle CYFD and that we should hold her accountable. But right now, what she's done with frightening results has been taking kids too often and putting them in dangerous situations. And when God forbid they're hurt or killed, there's a cover-up. In fact, you've heard the stories about a race text and people going and making sure they can protect politicians instead of protecting kids. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a separate unit that's going to investigate child safety away from CYFD. They have to determine whether that child should stay in the home. And then we're also going to empower foster parents across the state of New Mexico. Many of them are heroes, but they've been sidelined by this governor. And beyond that, we're going to stiffen penalties for those who commit child abuse. All right, Governor, do you your answer here? Now, every single tragedy <coughs> involving a child is one tragedy too many, and any governor who doesn't take that personally uh, isn't doing that job. I take that very personally. Look, CYFD had a huge vacancy when I took office in 2019. We've added 80 more social workers. We've sped up the time for investigations. We're closing double the number of investigations than the last administration. We're working now with institutions of higher education to specifically train and support social workers to go back into that field or to be trained in that field and come to CYFD. We are actually lifting up by investing in and providing raises to social workers. You can't expect to get a workforce if we're not going to respect them and train them and bring them in. But here's the answer. If we want to deal with CYFD, child, youth, and families, then we need fewer kids in the custody and care of CYFD. That means that we've got to get inside and do the prevention work of these vulnerable families in New Mexico. Governor, thank you. Mr. Ronchetti, you have a minute. Yeah, Governor, and I, and I know you take it personally, and I have no doubt of, that you do. I just don't think you take responsibility, and, and that's the issue in this whole thing. And when we look at taking more kids and making sure they're not involved in CYFD care, what we've seen is weakened child abuse laws in this respect, and you've had a hand in that. For people, and for, for people who are on drugs when they have a child, there's no longer a requirement that they be reported as child abuse. That is a mistake. We we oftentimes now have more and more investigations that never happen. And, and I don't know if that's the idea of, oh, well, if we have fewer investigations, there are few, fewer kids in danger. That's not true. That's something that a politician does to make things look better instead of a public servant who will absolutely go out and fix the problem. Look, too many good people in CYFD work under a, a fear of retribution, and they are scared. They want some sunlight in CYFD so we know where things stand in Sometimes it is going to be difficult on the road back with CYFD, but we can do it if we don't engage in cover-ups and making sure that we protect politicians before kids. All right, Governor, you may respond. Well, those allegations are completely false and, frankly, a bit outrageous. Look, I do agree that we need to respect the workers at CYFD. And again, I'm going to restate, we need fewer kids who are the responsibility of Children, Youth, and Family Services. What's the number one reason we see kids? Substance abuse drug abuse. Why do we have more of that today than we did before? Because we had a governor, my opponent's mentor, former governor Susana Martinez, who eradicated any access, deleted it, literally, private and public sector, any behavioral health for anyone in the state. It was a cataclysmic decision that has created numerous trouble and aspects and issues of risk for this state. That's a fact. And building it back is tough, but we are doing it. We have the cornerstones. The issue that you just, required, you just talked about, about reporting, look, that was supported by pediatricians, and here it is. If you are pregnant and have a drug abuse issue, you can come to us without fear of prosecution if you get the treatment and support that you need. That's it. Governor, thank you. We want to move on to homelessness. And before we get to the question, we, for time purposes, from now on, our rebuttals are going to have to be cut to 30 seconds just to, to fit everything in. So thank you for cooperating, candidates. Communities around New Mexico are struggling to handle people who are, at least for a time, homeless. Why do you believe we're having problems with homelessness? And how can the state best meet the needs of these cities and towns? We begin with Governor Lujan Grisham. 
Uh, thank you, Tessa. Look, there are three things that cause uh, chronic homelessness. Housing, mental illness, and drug addiction. And quite frankly, far too often, most of the folks that we're talking about have issues with all three. Right now, New Mexico is launching programs to build more than 6,000 houses statewide that will be affordable for families in New Mexico, with another 25 million that will come each year after that. We've invested money in transitional housing. We're investing money in crisis teams who will show up where individuals are. And we are making sure that we have the mental health services that need to be available including substance abuse. We've been launching that statewide. Most recently, we just did the groundbreaking at UNM for both an inpatient and outpatient treatment facility. But here, uh, we're going to need to do a little tough love, and that's going to mean probably more options for mandatory treatment, and I plan to propose in the next legislative session, uh, session uh, restrictions on panhandling and trespass for this population. All right. Mr. Ronchetti, your answer. Uh, the governor has a lot of lists there of things that have been done, and what I would ask people across the state is, how's it working out for you? How's it going? Has it gotten worse over the past four years, or has it gotten better? It has gotten far worse. So what we have to do, number one, provide the treatment necessary. There's no doubt. Whether that be mental health treatment, whether that be addiction treatment as well, there's no doubt those things will need to be done. But here's the fact. New Mexico cannot be allowed to be someone's campground. And we've seen it here in the Albuquerque area. Mayor Keller is proposing putting tent cities all over, and we see how that ends. The playbook is in California. It's in Los Angeles. It's in San Francisco. They allow these tent cities to explode. You go up to Portland, you see it there too. Seattle as well. It is a type of government that doesn't take this seriously. So what I'm proposing is a statewide ban on tent cities in New Mexico. I would sign that, absolutely. We'll get the help necessary, but you cannot sleep on the streets in the, street, in the state of New Mexico. And they're going to have to make a choice, and we think a lot of people will make the right choice if we provide them the compassionate option. Governor, 30 seconds. Well, look, that compassionate option has to include housing, and it's right. Uh, we don't have those 6,000 houses built because it's a brand new program. And while we might describe this differently because I think protections for folks, particularly women and children, half the people who are homeless in Albuquerque, New Mexico today, today are teenagers. So doing it better, doing it faster, but I agree. Tough love about what's happening here and not allowing folks to simply reject treatment does have to end in the state of New Mexico. Governor, thank you. Mr. Ronchetti, 30 seconds. Well, when we look at, at where we sit right now, and this is a statewide issue, I think what we have to begin to look at, too, and the governor mentions, you know, a, a lot of young girls that are part of this. This is a human trafficking issue, too, that comes up from the border, and that has not been addressed as well. The governor removed the National Guard from the border, and we have a major fentanyl crisis and human trafficking crisis coming up here, and that is also feeding the homeless problem. So until we take the border seriously, too, all of these issues will continue to explode. All right, we want to move on to our state's water supply. Persistent drought is hitting the southwest hard. What is your plan to protect and conserve New Mexico's water? Mr. Ronchetti, we begin with you. Well, I, I think at this point, what we first have to do is realize that water is a precious resource, and we have to do everything possible to get as much of it as we can and to hold on to it as much as we can. Unfortunately, the governor's policies have been lacking. And in fact, she lost a great state engineer about a year ago, and, and much of the, the media Media reports on it say he was very frustrated because there is no commitment to investing money in our water future. Look, I have a background in meteorology. Nothing is more important than water in the state of New Mexico. There's no other way to cut it. So what do we have to do? Well, the way we capture water has to change because we get less water flowing off the mountains, off the winter snowpack versus the summer rains. We have to make some engineering changes there. We have to go after desalinization and be a leader in the desalinization front. The way we transport water as well. Across the southern portion of the state, we have to be as efficient as we can be. We can meet the needs of the people of this state, but it will take significant commitment that to this point has not happened. In fact, there are some people in Santa Fe who support having the state engineer not be an engineer anymore. Have them be a politician. Horrible idea. Governor, you may respond. 
Look, my opponent uh, doesn't believe in climate change. Climate change has led to the ridification, uh, the drying of the state. He also doesn't support the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a game changer for water, not just for New Mexico, but for the entire Southwest. It's got $20 billion to address the lack of water from the Colorado River, which is basically where we get our water, at least surface water in the state. We need conservation. We need better innovation and better management. Look, we've invested millions of dollars in shoring up our water infrastructure so that desalination, conservation, delivering water wherever it goes can actually occur because the investments and infrastructure are there to actually do it. This is a candidate who wants oil and gas to repeal all of the protections that we have in climate change, including that we require oil and gas to recycle their water. They're not allowed to use fresh water anymore because of the changes that I made as governor in my administration. Governor, thank you. Mr. Ronchetti, 30 seconds. I don't know what the governor means by uh, I support oil and gas re repealing. Oil and gas can't repeal anything that the governor puts forward here. So I'm not sure where she's going with that. And climate change is real. I've said that. I've been clear on it, but we can address it without crushing our energy sector. And the problem is the governor's policies are doing that. Remember, in the last legislative session, she supported raising your gas prices 35 cents a gallon. Why? Because they do it in California. That's her playbook. And she's also trying to get sales of electric cars in New Mexico to be sevenfold higher in just a few years. The average battery-operated car is $66,000. It's going to crush families. Governor, your response? Well, that's a made-up response because we are doing renewable energy, and in fact, renewable energy is part of water conservation in a number of innovation ways. We're now the second largest oil and gas producer, so when my opponent talks about not working with oil and gas or any industry, it's just flat not true. We're going to work with all of the other states and the federal government to make sure that both surface and groundwater gets addressed for the state for the next hundreds of years. And I do believe that brackish water and ways in which we deliver water to ag have to be part of those solutions. Okay. Candidates, thank you. We've actually, actually reached the conclusion of tonight's debate. It is now time for closing statements. And per the rules, you will each have one minute to make your final case. Uh, as per the outcome of our coin toss earlier, Mr. Ronchetti, you're going to go first. Thanks very much, Matt. And Governor, thank you very much. I appreciate you all sitting through this tonight. I think you can see two very different visions of the state of New Mexico. One vision is a vision that has put us in a very, very difficult spot in a bunch of different areas, whether it be sky high crime, our kids not being educated like they should be, or your pocketbook issues where you have more month than money. But one thing I think is most important to think about is we must all believe that it can get better, that, that we can do things better, and that the worst thing that can happen to us is for us to think, it's New Mexico. It, we've always had high crime. We can address crime. We can address the issues like education that affect us. And we can address making sure your family has everything it needs to be successful. But we have to support change to do it. And I would appreciate your vote. You can go look on our website at all our plans. We've been as detailed as any gubernatorial candidate in recent memory on detailed plans because you deserve them. And we have a chance at a new direction and we would love your support. Mr. Ronchetti, thank you. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, your closing remarks. Thank you, Tessa. Well, voters in New Mexico do have a choice to make. Uh, and I know that times are tough. They have been. But I think that New Mexicans want uh, an experienced, proven leader who can make the tough decisions, who has a record to make those decisions, particularly when we're saving thousands of lives, whether that's a pandemic, devastating wildfires, or floods. And my record about investments in the areas that matter most, like education, have occurred and will continue to occur. Universal pre-K, expanded daycare, highest paid educators in the Southwest and our region, free higher education, both and trade schools for New Mexicans. That's not happening anywhere else in America. But what is also on the ballot is a woman's right to make deeply personal health care decisions. I will continue to fight to protect women and their families by making sure that access to reproductive health care is not fettered and is not politicized. Not now, not ever. I hope I've earned your vote again tonight. 
Thank you, Governor. And with that, our gubernatorial debate has ended. And we hope you will join us for our debates next month for New Mexico's candidates for Congress. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our candidates. We'll return to NBC's regularly scheduled programming at 8. Good night. Every balloon fiesta is amazing, but this is the 50th celebration, so we're going all out. We will have coverage for you on the field, on air, online at KOB.com for all of the fan favorites, and of course, the balloonatic himself forecast. And with all of the new stuff we're going to be looking for, we've also got some old familiar faces coming your way. Happy 50th anniversary. Happy anniversary to balloon fiesta.